Thanks, Rich. Just um, Richard speaking about masterpieces reminded me that there's a bunch of us here who have a friend who has a friend who um, has an original Goldie, uh, a painting by famous painter Goldie, um, and uh, he just keeps it in a wardrobe. Um, and um, it recently got stolen, and it was in the news, because it's quite a big deal, this um, Goldie painting getting stolen, and um, the photo that appeared in all the news articles was just this very, like, um, terrible photo taken from a weird angle that my friend had taken. Um, cheers. Um, my friend had taken this photo, I don't know why he took such a weird photo, but it was the only photo that anyone had of this great painting, uh, so it was the only photo they had to use in the media. Uh, thankfully it was returned, or, or that we, the police found it, um, and returned to its owner, and I'm hoping that um, he keeps it on the wall. <laughs> um, and um, you know, if you, we're all a masterpiece, then don't be hidden away in the wardrobe, you know. Um, but hey, um, yesterday we talked about you know, the, the events of Easter as being really good news for a world that is desperate for good news. And today I want us to think a little bit about our present context. So yesterday was looking back. Today is about looking around and asking the question, what would it be or what does it mean for us to be agents of that good news or carriers of that good news in 21st century Aotearoa? Um, you know, in New Zealand, I think if you're anything like me, maybe your perception of what it's like or what it means to be a Kiwi has actually changed a little bit over the last year because New Zealand has been in all the headlines and often held up as a kind of um, shining example of how to do things right. Um, Recently I read, this was just a few months ago, um, something that a UK UK writer wrote about New Zealand um, and it's extremely flattering, but let's just go with it. Let's just indulge in this. Um, (laughs) New Zealand is presenting itself on the world stage as a beautiful, progressive, intelligent, smart, forward-thinking, quick-to-react, compassionate country, rich in culture, heritage, and with the best five million people on the planet, a shining beacon of gloom leading the way, exemplary, where others can't, New Zealand can. And, um, you know, uh, it's a little bit, yeah, I know, it's right, it's like, well, shucks, um, But, you know, for those of us who uh, live here, as much as we are grateful to be in New Zealand uh, the last year to be uh, a kind of a little bit of a sort of enclave from much of the chaos that's going on around the world, um, we also know that, you know, this place isn't perfect. And it's often something that we wrestle with as a society is why is it that in a place that is kind of marketed as paradise on earth effectively, um, that, that we have so many negative statistics, you know, so many people, young people taking their lives, for example, and we wrestle with that. We know that it's not perfect. We're thankful to be here, but it's not a perfect place. And I wonder too, for a lot of Christians, in fact, I don't wonder, I know that for a lot of Christians, there's a feeling that New Zealand is changing and not always for the better. You know, there's a feeling that um, sometimes for those of us who have lived long enough, there's a feeling that sometimes goes where it's like, you know, once upon a time I felt a bit more at home as a Christian in New Zealand, and now I feel a little bit like it's not so much home or at home or as comfortable or something like that. And I want us to think a little bit about that feeling and how we actually respond in this moment where we might feel like we're not quite at home in the same way. And I think um, the Bible actually gives us a very powerful way to think about this kind of moment in time. And it's the theme of exile. And exile really kicks in right near the beginning of the Bible. You think about this story of Adam and Eve, and they're placed in this garden. Um, and as we all know, um, Adam and Eve sin. And this is how it describes it in Genesis 3. The Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. So there's this, right there in Genesis 3, there's this idea of exile. There's a sense that um, humans have been removed from their sense of home. And it's not so much about geography. It's not that um, we're just really longing to get back to some place, sort of mysterious place in the Middle East with talking snakes. It's not so much about geography, right? It's about something in here. It's a sense that part of the human condition in our our sinful state, if you like, is that we feel 
banished. We feel exiled. We have restless hearts is what, the, um, what St. Augustine said. And most, uh, I think most humans, most people can relate to this sense that we all have these restless hearts, a sense that we're not quite home, even when we are at home, if you know what I mean. And so right from the beginning, it's saying, you know, to be a, a human, at least a sinful human, is to be in exile. And I just want to spend a moment as we think about Adam and Eve and we think about human rebellion and sin. I want us to just take a moment to talk a little bit about how do we think about sin? Because this is going to become um, useful for us as we go on um, this morning throughout this talk. Um, You know, sometimes we think of sin um, in relatively kind of flippant ways. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, for example, hell pizza. Um, You know, welcome to hell, home of the seven deadly sins. Um, and Hell is Hell Pizza is a franchise that I mean most of you will be aware of it. Um, is a pizza franchise that's really built its entire sort of um, shtick, its kind of marketing, as based on the idea of having fun with sin. And I'm not saying don't eat at Hell Pizza or anything like that. Um, that's I don't know, it's just another debate, I guess. But, um, but my point is simply that this is just a reflection of how um, generally in the wider culture we tend to think about sin. You know, it's kind of like, it's used in like marketing a lot for chocolate and your pizza and that kind of thing. It's something sinfully good. It's the idea that like, it's a little bit naughty, but it's actually just really nice and fun. You know what I mean? And so it's kind of like not that big a deal. And um, like I said, not really having a go at these guys, just simply saying this is just a kind of reflection of attitude that's kind of pretty prevalent. And even as uh, Christians, although we're probably not quite that flippant most of the time, um, I think we do sometimes have a a, a bit of a limited understanding of sin because we do kind of revert to this sort of slightly Sunday schoolish mentality, which is it's a a bunch of rules that for some reason God has that we're not supposed to break. And for that reason, I find... um, this theologian called Cornelius Plantinger, who has a really helpful way of talking about sin. And he talks about sin in terms of this idea of shalom. Has anyone ever heard the word shalom before? Hebrew word? Yeah. And we know what it means, right? Or it's usually translated as peace. And he, he says this word shalom is really important for understanding the biblical concept of sin. So let me quote him here and, and explain a little bit. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, and delight. Shalom, in other words, is the way things ought to be. God hates sin not just because it violates his law, but more substantively because it violates shalom, because it breaks the peace, because it interferes with the way things are supposed to be. So you know this word peace that we, we translate shalom to peace a lot of the time, but peace in, in English has slightly, um, a, not negative connotations in the sense that they're um, bad connotations, but it's a, about an absence, right? It's about an absence of conflict. And so we all think that that's a good thing. Peace is good, but it doesn't speak of, of the good thing that comes in that absence, right? So the absence of conflict is peace, but shalom is not just the absence of conflict, but the presence of wholeness, of, of flourishing, of goodness, of uh, welfare, human well-being. That is shalom. I think it's a much more powerful idea than the word peace conveys. And the reason why God hates sin, Planting is saying, is because it violates the, the shalom, the, the, the welfare or the, the flourishing of the human community. And so when we engage in anything, any part of the sort of um, bad news of the world, if we're contributing to the sin in the world, we're in a sense um, undercutting God's project of pouring out and filling his creation with shalom. And so uh, to me, that's a really helpful way to think about sin. That it's not just a bunch of arbitrary rules. It's about, it's about fostering or it's about the tendency for us to undercut um, that kind of fostering of flourishing. Now, um, returning to this idea of exile, you know, Adam and Eve are exiled from the garden. And this idea of home and exile, of being where you're meant to be and then being banished from it, it runs right throughout the Old Testament and, in fact, the New Testament too. But the Old Testament specifically, um, you know, you get, 
the Israelites get to the edge of the promised land and Moses preaches this epic sermon, which is basically the book of Deuteronomy. And towards the end of Deuteronomy, Moses lays out two paths for Israel. And he says, if, if we obey God, then things are going to go well. There will be shalom in the land. Things are just going to take off. It's gonna, it's gonna, we're going to flourish. We're going to thrive here. That's if we obey. But if we disobey, then we'll be removed from our land. And that's not just removal from wealth, which it is, because to be taken from the land is to be taken from everything that produces wealth. But it's not just that, it's also to be taken away from your sense of identity, your sense of who you are as God's chosen people. So there are two paths, the path of, obe- the path of obedience and you'll flourish, or the path of disobedience and you'll go into exile. And as we know, that's exactly what happens to Israel. They get dragged off into exile. Now, I think this is a helpful way for us to think a little bit about our moment in time. Now, I have to say, and I want to really kind of underline this, I actually do feel a little bit conflicted about talking about 21st century or 2021 Aotearoa as, uh, as exile for the church, because I think we can overdo this a bit. You know, some of the things that we find are challenging as Christians in our present time uh, pale in comparison to the kinds of challenges that Christians face in other parts of the world and throughout time. And, you know, like we've already talked about, in many ways, this is one of the best places to be on earth, right? Christian or otherwise. And so I think we can go a bit overboard and go, whoa, whoa, is me, we're in exile. Um, and, and so I don't want to be that. And I hope as I talk that that will come through, that that's exactly the kind of attitude that I want to um, speak against in some way. Um, but nevertheless, with all those caveats being said, I think exile is still a helpful way, a, a biblical way of thinking our current situation because there is just, you know, rightly or wrongly, that feeling that we have that New Zealand's changing, the world's changing perhaps, um, and that makes us feel like maybe we're a little bit on the margins, that our beliefs, our ideas, our way of life is no longer quite flavor of the month. Um, you know, we look around at recent law changes around abortion and euthanasia. Um, I know that there's a lot of issues around sexuality and gender that are being debated and have various law changes that have gone on around that. And all these sorts of things uh, felt like they were probably a distant reality a few decades ago. And so we can look at that and we can think, man, those were the good old days. That was when it was a lot easier to be a Christian because New Zealand was Christian, right? That's sort of sometimes the mentality. I think the reality is actually more complex. Um, New Zealand faith, I think, has always been quite privatized. By that, by that I mean New Zealanders haven't tended to sort of take their faith into the public sphere, you know, into politics in quite the same way as we see in the United States, for example. Um, so to sort of say that New Zealand was once a Christian nation, it, it's uh, maybe overstating it a little bit. But, um, but, you know, there's still some kind of a kernel of truth there. Um, I also think it's a bit more complex because sometimes Christians just disagree on what actually constitutes being Christian and not Christian, right? You can have that feeling of like, you know, this country's becoming less Christian and there are other Christians who love Jesus just as much as you do who look at it and go, no, 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 this is a step forward for us. Um, and so that's complex too. Um, you know, there are things that have changed that are actually more Christian, if you like. You know, there are things that have changed that... Uh, once upon a time, we might have sort of just put up with and tolerated that these days we might look at that and say, that's not very Christ-like, you know, and so um, things like racism and sexism and environmental degradation, those are not necessarily always uh, topics that we've always thought of as um, particularly sort of hot button issues for the church. And yet there are times where those might have been more socially acceptable than they are now. Um, in the church, and not to say that those things are gone by any stretch, but just to say that, you know, advances in those areas are probably uh, for the better. Um, and another thing that I think adds a bit of complexity to this picture is the fact that um, sometimes really what's being challenged is not sort of Christianity as such, but just certain groups who once upon a time had a lot of cultural power don't have as much anymore. So the picture is more complicated, and that's why I think we can kind of overdo the exile talk a little bit. But with all those things being said, I think most of us understand that there is something that is changing. 
Sometimes it feels like it's changing quite fast. It, New Zealand is becoming more pluralistic, or has become more pluralistic. One in four Kiwis was born abroad. You know, and so that fact alone makes New Zealand more diverse. It brings in more um, worldviews, more um, religious traditions, um, and more perspectives on, on life. That means that traditional expressions of Christianity are no longer the default setting for an average Kiwi. I mean, to an average Kiwi doesn't really exist. It probably never did, but it, it even less exists now, if I can say that, because New Zealand is becoming so much more diverse. And so if you were to take a sort of any hypothetical person living in our country, we can no longer just sort of assume that they're sort of more or less Christian, like we might have once upon a time, or people might have at least said, you know, they were nominally Christian. They ticked the box in the census, even if it wasn't something that they live, they live out. And that perception of New Zealand is changing. And some, for some Christians, they look at the changes and on the whole say, you know, we're becoming more godless as a nation. There's a feeling of loss there. I mean, the, yes, the reality is complex, but there is a feeling of, of loss that things are changing. And when things are changing and it feels like life's getting harder to follow Jesus in a way that feels like it's faithful way to follow in Christ, and that becomes more challenging, then it's natural to pine for a time where it felt simpler, easier. It's natural to look back and feel a sense of nostalgia and feel a sense of loss. And I think that that's actually what we find in the Bible. When Israel is taken off into exile, we read in Psalm 137, for example, this is when Judah is taken off into exile in Babylon. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion, Jerusalem. There on the poplars, we hung our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? You can, you can hear the hurt there. They've been dragged away from you know, their, their homeland, place where they felt like they could be the people of God that they were meant to be. And they're dragged off into Babylon, removed from everything that they know, everything that feels like home, and everything that they feel is essential for them to be able to faithfully follow God. And so here they paint this picture and they're saying, you know, our, our, our tormentors, our captors are telling us to sing songs about God. But how can we do that? We're so far from home. We're in exile. And there's a looking back and a wishing that for a pining for the good old days here. And so it's normal. And, and uh, we might even say there's a certain kind of healthiness to looking back and feeling a sense of loss when we feel like we are in exile to some degree. But we can also get stuck in that mode. We can get stuck in this kind of grief mode. You know, sometimes um, psychologists talk about the five stages of grief, and it's the idea that you, you, different stages of grief after a great loss come along, and you're going to feel different at different stages, and that's healthy, but you need to cycle through those. You don't get stuck in any one of them. And I wonder if sometimes we get stuck in this, this sort of mentality. How can we sing this Lord's song in this place? You know, it's just getting harder and harder. And we get stuck in that. And the temptation there is to wage a culture war. I think the temptation for us is, is, is to look at the world and go, it's not like it used to be. It's becoming more godless. So let's do battle. Let's fight culture. And I think this is what um, we've seen in, in American evangelicalism. And I'm so grateful for so much of the American church. Um, I've learned so much um, from American Christians. I've been, I did a master's degree in the States in theology, and I was, I was shaped by the professors there. I'm married to an American. You know, so I'm very grateful for um, what many of the things that the American church has given us. So I'm not, it's not sort of a blanket slamming here. But we have noticed, I think, over the last few years that um, that, that culture war mentality that war that's been waged by many evangelicals, not all, but many evangelicals in America, has turned septic the last few years. And I think that that's a bit of a warning sign for us. As we feel a sense of exile or increasing exile, we're going to be tempted to engage in a culture war. 
But I think if we play that forward a bit, it could turn septic. And I don't think that's the way we want to go. I don't think we're there yet, but I do see sometimes that attitude creeping in. And I think we've got to be a little bit careful about that. And I think there's a prophet, Jeremiah, who warned his people against that too. And it's a little surprising because Jeremiah, he's sometimes known as the weeping prophet. You know, he wrote the book of Lamentations and it's just a book about being really, really gutted, really, really sad, really, really torn up about exile. So Jeremiah is the kind of guy that you might expect to be just constantly looking back and longing for the good old days. And he actually sends a letter to the exiles who have been dragged off into Babylon about what, how they ought to live. And if it's you know, consistent with lamentations and that sort of thing, you might expect Jeremiah to sort of you know, say kind of a, a kind of woe is us sort of message in his letter. But I want to read you what he actually says in, in this letter to the exiles. So this is the letter. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Seek the peace and prosperity of that place. I think that's a surprising message from Jeremiah. Here they are removed from the promised land. Everything that they felt was absolutely essential for them to be the people of God. And he says, you know what? Yeah, you're in a pagan land, you know. But while you're there, seek the peace and prosperity of the place. And you know what the the word is here for peace? It's shalom. Seek the shalom. Seek for this place to flourish. If it flourishes, you'll flourish too. And I think that's so interesting because Israel's job was always about seeking shalom. You know, ever since... Adam and Eve took that, uh, that forbidden step and rebelled against God and were cast into exile, and that's been the human condition ever since. There's been a kind of a longing for shalom to re-enter this place, and that has been God's project. That has been what God is all about. And so he takes Israel through Abraham and says, you're going to be my beacon of shalom in the world. That is your job. So that was their job. And now they get dragged off into exile, away from the temple, away from the promised land. And what is their job now? It's exactly the same. It's still to seek shalom. Yeah, the context has changed. Yeah, the surroundings have changed. Yeah, the challenges have changed. But the job is exactly the same. It's still to seek shalom. It's still to be an agent of all that is good in the world. And I think that's a word for us too. You know, yeah, the culture's changing, but our job hasn't changed. We're still to be a a people of shalom, a people that embody shalom and are agents of it, kind of vessels of shalom to the world. I think we're, in a sense, when we're faced with a growing sense of exile, we're faced with two different options. One is that we can engage in a culture war, Or one is we can go about seeking shalom. And I want to contrast these two um, by just throwing a table up here. And looking at a few different examples of what these two different attitudes might look like in practice. So in the middle column there, we've got the fighting culture mentality, right? That's the, we're going to wage a culture war mentality. And then over here is the seeking shalom mentality, and then down on the, um, that column over there, we've got a few different sort of areas or aspects of this. So let's just have a look. I think, okay, posture, the overall kind of attitude, if you like. In fighting culture, the attitude or the posture is hostile. We're at war, right? 
So we're, we're almost inherently hostile to the culture around us. But if we're seeking shalom, we're hospitable, we're kind, we're gentle. The enemy, who is the enemy for us in this moment? Well, if we're fighting culture, then the enemy is usually the political other. Those people. Those people that, like, that want the law that way, right? Those people at that end of the spectrum. It's just, it's just them, not us. But if we're seeking shalom, we recognize that the enemy are spiritual forces, or as the New Testament sometimes puts it, princes, uh, um, powers and principalities, right? It's the hidden forces. It's not our fellow human beings. It's not just the people at the other end of the political spectrum. It's these hidden forces. That's where the battle is, right? That's where the enemy is. What about the kind of power we seek? Well, I think when we fight in culture, we seek top-down kind of power. We try to, we take, we get our political party together and we go in and we storm in and we try to take over parliament and, and then impose laws from the top down so that everyone will live and act like us. But if we're seeking shalom, we're going to be bottom up. We're just going to get a, go about the business of seeking shalom in our own little context and letting that infiltrate our society and hopefully transform it that way. What about our church identity or how we see ourselves as a church? Well, if we're engaged in a culture war, if we're fighting culture, we get into a persecution complex. You know, that we are being persecuted. And, and this is what I was sort of talking about before. It's like we can way overdo the exile talk and lose perspective on, on the challenges that we've got. Yes, there are challenges. And yes, there are challenges that we didn't have a few decades ago. But we can easily slip into almost a siege mentality or persecution complex. But if we're seeking shalom, we just seek to bless those who curse us, to quote Jesus. Right? I mean, and here, note here that there will be people who curse us. It's not as if it's going to be easy. Um, but we respond to that with blessing, with love, with prayer, and that kind of thing. Now, n- neither of these categories are hard and fast. Like, there's no sort of one-size-fits-all approach to culture. For example, there are, going to be, there are things going on in the world, and there are going to be times where we need to be, maybe not hostile, but take a stance. Um, there will be times where it's appropriate to use and even seek some sort of top-down kind of power and mechanisms. Yeah, yeah that's appropriate. But what I'm talking about is sort of a general picture here of a sort of general posture. We can go to war with culture, or we can just go about the business of seeking shalom. And I think it's the seeking shalom that is more in line with what Christ would have us do. When I um, talk about this topic of exile, um, my actual favorite place to go, as good as Jeremiah is, is actually the book of First Peter. First Peter to me is absolutely gold when we're talking about this because it's so relatable to our situation. I've got a friend who is doing a doctorate in the book of First Peter. And uh, because I found First Peter really interesting, I was asked him one day, I said, what are the experts? You know, you're an expert and you read the experts. What do the experts think was going on in First Peter's uh, audience? The interesting thing is, he said, the experts think, and you know, they're sometimes wrong, but they think that the, the people that F- Peter was writing to in First Peter weren't being persecuted as such. They weren't, you know, that happens elsewhere in the New Testament, but they weren't being rounded up and tortured or being told to denounce their faith or, or being executed. None of that. They were just being socially ostracized. They were being criticized. They were being called bigots or, or superstitious or old-fashioned or probably not old-fashioned, but you get the idea, you know, it was more like people were talking down on them, but they weren't, their lives weren't th- under threat or anything like that at that point. And I think, man, we can relate to that a little bit, you know, to whatever extent we are in exile, it's mostly that kind of experience, right? It's like we're not literally having our lives threatened. We're still free to meet together as Christians, still uh, free to be Christians. And as I've said already many times, uh, we have it good in many, so many ways here. Um, but we get that. We get that feeling. You know, it's just not as easy as it used to be. We're no longer quite as respectable as we used to be. There are some people in New Zealand who see New- to be Christian as quite regressive, um, to be quite bigoted and all that kind of a thing. But this is what Peter says. I mean, he says so much 
gold. But just one famous thing he says to his audience. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. Actually, let me just pause there and go back a stage. Foreigners and exiles. He refers to his audience as foreigners and exiles, but they weren't. Not literally. They were citizens of the place they were living. So it wasn't like they, they weren't like the, um, Judah, often Babylon. Not literal exiles, but he calls them exiles for the exact reason we've been talking about today is because when you're trying to seek shalom and you're a follower of Christ, you're going to find yourself at odds with the kind of world that you find yourself wherever you are, right? And so he writes to his audience as exiles, even though they weren't literal exiles. And that's how we sometimes feel. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. There's a way to live as an exile that, yeah, you're not going to be all that popular and yeah, you're going to face criticism But you can live in such a way that still gives people a strong sense of the undeniable goodness of your life. Sort of an unshakable sense that there is something deeply good permeating you and shaping you and how you live your life individually and as church communities. And it's about living these undeniably good lives. And I like what he says here because he's, he's... He's acknowledging the fact, yeah, there's going to be criticism. It's not going to be easy. There's going to be opposition. But live lives of undeniable goodness, and it won't, they won't be able to deny it. That's what it literally is, right? A goodness that is undeniable. If we want to live such good lives here that they'll see God and um, see our good deeds, rather, and praise God sooner or later, then that's going to happen not because we waged a culture war, but because we went about the business of seeking shalom. So I want to end today with a targum. I sometimes do this. Those those are friends of mine who hear me preach a little bit um, will know that occasionally I I pull out a targum, which is a Jewish way of um, grappling with scripture. A targum is to take a piece of scripture and to adapt it to your present situation. So I've got a targum based on uh, Jeremiah's letter to the exiles, Jeremiah 29. Um, now, it's not scripture, right? Can I just um, underline that? It's not scripture. It's my interpretation, a kind of adaptation of scripture for our moment. And I want to uh, read this to you and, in a sense, almost pray this over us um, as we close up. <clears throat> This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of every tribe and nation, says to all those specifically chosen to live in this time and place, having gone from a so-called Christian nation to a pluralistic one, in which at times you may feel like you're in exile. Put down roots in your community. Live in all sorts of jobs and trades. Befriend your neighbors and get to know the locals. Live in good lives among them. Invest in your kids and fellow believers, kids too, living out a faith marked by hope and love that will be passed on from generation to generation. Also, seek the shalom of the place to which I have appointed you to live in this cultural moment. Seek the flourishing of Matamata, of Putaruru, of Masterton, of New Plymouth, of Cambridge, of Hamilton, of Torbay, of Auckland, of the Waikato, or wherever else in the country you find yourself. Pray to the Lord for Aotearoa, because if it thrives you will thrive. Amen. Thank you.